Good morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you also. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, your humble children, invoke your blessing on all your children today. We adore you, whose name is love whose nature is compassion, whose presence is joy, whose word is truth, whose spirit is goodness, whose holiness is beauty, whose will is peace, whose service is perfect freedom, and in knowledge of whom stands our eternal life. Unto you be all honor and all glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning and welcome to you all on a special Friends and Neighbors Open House Sunday here at First United Methodist Church. What a joy it is to have you with us this morning. If you're a guest with us for the very first time, we offer you a warm First Church welcome and hope you'll feel at home with us today and come back and see us again next week. I want to invite you to visit our information center this morning. You can uh, get there just by going through my door on the left here, right outside the door. We have a wonderful information center there that will provide you details on our ministry, all kinds of information to take home with you as well. Then we'd like to ask you to stay a few minutes after worship today and stroll through the garden area and visit some of the booths that we have set up there. There are information centers uh, that are uh, staffed there basically by volunteers and staff members sharing with you details about our various ministries in the life of this congregation. And then you want to get out to the food after that, right? We've got food out there. Uh, Chef Tom's prepared some wonderful cuisine for everyone to uh, share today. And we'd love to have you stop by and enjoy some of the food fellowship with others as well. I'm still wearing my name tag that I picked up at the hospitality tent there. We invite you to pick up one as well. It's the first church name tag. Instead of writing your name on the name tag, we invite you to put your zip code on the name tag, okay? No names, just zip code. So I'm 76248 right there, see there? And uh, you can identify me that way. And if someone else here is a 76248, I'd love to meet you today. Or I'd like to meet you in, you're in another zip code as well. So mix around, find out which zip code areas uh, people live in who are with us today and meet a new friend or two this morning before you leave. Also we have a gift for you, a calendar that you can pick up. It's a magnetic calendar. We'd like you to take that home as well so you remember every Sunday morning it's a wonderful time to be in worship with us here and uh, I threatened that I circle my birthday on every one of them but I really didn't uh, do that. But uh, we invite you to circle yours and the school holidays and all the things. Keep it on your refrigerator and enjoy it as well this morning. A couple of other announcements. We have one regarding a musician who needs a residence. Um, 
for this coming year. He's from China and uh, needs some housing, some board and room. If you'd be interested in housing someone who is an accomplished musician visiting us from China, please see me after the worship service today and I have details for you. Also, a book club is uh, starting up this evening, 6 o'clock p.m., also on Wednesday evening at 7. You can come and enjoy supper at 6.30, call in your reservation, and you're welcome to join a new book club study on Freakonomics, a rogue economic explores the hidden side of everything. So uh, join us tonight for that. If you'd like to see Linda or myself about that after the service, and we'll share more details with you as well. If you'd be interested in membership with us today, we also invite you to fill out this uh, card that's in your pew rack, bring it forward at the end of the service, and we'd have the joy of welcoming you into our community of faith today. Here again is a calendar, and please pick one up, a name tag as you leave, and enjoy meeting some new friends today. And we welcome you again on a special Friends uh, and Neighbors Sunday. One other announcement, next Saturday from 5 to 10, you'll want to be here for the 5th Street Festival. We have some wonderful music lined up. There's information on the in, inside of your bulletin. Uh, sharing some of the musicians who'll be with us, Sarah Hickman, many of you know Sarah. Uh, Brave Combos, known throughout the area. A wonderful musician there, musical group there. Also, the proceeds from this will benefit the Hurricane Katrina relief efforts. There'll be, uh, Mr. Mark will be here, uh, Tom McDermott with some storytelling, and Nana Puddin's gonna be with us. They're here also for Sunday School today, and. Uh, well, look who showed up. Nana Puddin's here. Share a word with us today. Well, it is a blessing to be with you today. We had a wonderful earlier program with the children, and we had a great time with them. And next week, something very, very special. I encourage every one of you, you have to have the opportunity to go attend, is the 5th Street Festival. I know you will not be disappointed. You will leave very much blessed. Well, I brought a little friend with me today, and I told him that he could come out if he behaved. And if he does behave, it's gonna be the very first time, so I'm kind of waiting to see. I'm gonna go ahead and grab him out here. Hickory, 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 I need you to come out. I don't want him. Hickory, there are people out here. It's, it's gonna be embarrassing if you don't come out. I know. <laughs> All right. Oh, wow, good morning. Do they talk? Yes, they talk. Who pulls their string? No, no, no. They're, they're, able, to, they're able to talk on their own. Huh? Yeah, everyone here can talk on their own. No, you're, you're joking me. No, no. You, you mean they don't have someone controlling them? Well, all of us, we need to allow God to control our lives. Oh, yeah, that's what I was getting at. Oh, it was, huh? Yeah. Hickory, uh huh. How would you like to introduce us today? Hey, I can do that? Yes, you can do that. I never get to do that. Okay, go ahead. Good morning, my name is Hickory McNutt, and this is my sidekick, Tim. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, you're my sidekick. Oh, I forgot. Hey, look. What? There's a balcony. Yes, yes, of course there's a balcony. Jump. No, no. <laughs> Just kidding. I yeah, it was very funny. Hickory, uh -huh. I think it'd be fun if we told a joke. A, a joke? Yes, we're in church. Huh, I think that this one might be okay. I, I, are you sure? Yes, I think this one will be okay. What do I need to do? Well, I need you to remember this little phrase, I give up, what is it? I give up, uh-huh. Uh, uh, what is it? I don't know. No. <laughs> You're supposed to say the phrase, I give up, what is it? I give up, uh-huh. Uh, uh, what is it? Oh. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay, let's see here. I know, I'm gonna give this little phrase and you say, I give up, uh-huh. What is it? Okay, let's see here. What does a mama elephant have that no other elephant has? They're the elephants. No, no, Hick Hickory, you're supposed to say, I give up, what is it? Oh yeah, I forgot, <laughs> do it again. Okay, let's see here. Oh, this is an old one. What? What is black and white and red all over? A newspaper, silly. No. Hickory, you're supposed to say, I give up. What is it? I give up. Uh-huh. What is it? That's right. I don't understand why you're having such a hard time remembering that little phrase. I don't know. I'm a little embarrassed and scared. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, Hickory, I have a hard time remembering things, too. You, you do? Yes. But I do remember a few things. For example, uh-huh. 
When I was very little, I was laying in my crib, uh-huh, looking up at the ceiling, yeah, and my dad walked in, looked down at me, and, and do you know what he said? I give up. What is it? <laughs> Hickory. I don't think that was very funny. I do. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's about time for you to go. You get in. No, no, no. It's time for you to go. Ah, uh, you get in. Tim, next time we fly. Yes. You get in there, and I'll sit in the airplane seat. No, because you see, the person you sit next to, uh huh, would end up sitting next to a dummy. Well, I understand that people you sit next to are used to that. No. All right, here. minutes and then we're going to go in with Hi. the young ones. Oh, that'll be fun. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's fun. So we're here today for a do? very special program. Yeah. And we're going to be doing some object lessons with object. the young ones. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. Yes. You want to do one here? They yes. like it. Go ahead. I brought a very special one to share with them here today. Oh, they're going to like this. Okay, go ahead. Yes. And I'll I'm just sure, sit here. Okay, everyone I'm sure has brought their Bible today because today we're going to be talking about studying our Bible. And, well, this good, strong piece of rope can help us to learn how to study our okay. Bible. Go yes. ahead. What? Go ahead. Don't interrupt. I won't. Okay. I sit. We need a good, strong, good, strong relationship with God. And oh, I know, I know. Tim, is this the one with the, with the rope and they think it's just one rope? But it's really two ropes, and you move the knot, woo hoo, like that, and it's really two ropes, well, and they think it's one, it's a trick. Gigi. Can you fool them? You can't tell them how it's done. Oh. That ruins. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, so I'm sorry. Okay, I'm gonna do I'm one sorry. more. Okay. One more. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. My grandfather was a director of a Christian camp for 36 years, and he worked with hundreds and hundreds and thousands of young people, and he gave me this box. And yes. Trap door, but they don't know it is a trap door. And they think there is a trap door in the box. Is this that one? Gigi, you yeah. can't tell them how it's done. I didn't always put it. <laughs> they didn't well, hear. we are very excited to be with everyone today. And we have some wonderful things. We're going to talk with the children about the Bible today. And once again, I encourage you to next weekend to attend the fifth street festival. I know you will not be disappointed. Well, you have a wonderful and blessed afternoon and we'll see you again.
reading from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 3 through 10. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statues of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness, in heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go on, how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The baptism of young children is always a joyous occasion in the life of the church. And today, Allison and Jess Jones bring their son to be baptized. of God. Baptism is a sign to us of the mercy and grace of God, indicating that we do not come into a relationship with God based on anything that we do or anything that we are, but upon the basis of God's gracious invitation toward us. The baptism of infants is a particularly significant manifestation of this sign. Remember now the words of Jesus when he said, let the little children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. I ask you now in the presence of God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Powell Brown in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly and to lead a Christian life. Powell Brown, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now if you'll place your hands on it. Pal Brown, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's take a walk here. Pal Brown is the newest member of the household of faith, and we, along with his parents, pledge ourselves and all that we have, all that we are, to participate in nurturing him in the Christian faith so that as he grows up among us, he will come to the place in his own life where he'll stand at this or some other altar and make his own profession of faith in Christ. All of this is God's great gift offered to us without price. Let us respond as his new faith family. With God's help, we will so order, order our, our lives, lives after, after the, the example, example of Christ, Christ that Powell Brown, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal.
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the dead, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good and what you with, so that your youth is the new life of the Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution or famine, or nakedness or peril or sword? God of infinite love and compassion, when we are afraid, when we feel alone, when our faith does not seem to be enough to sustain us, you remain steadfast in your love for us. Who are we that you are mindful of us? In all of this vast universe with its beauty and drama, why would we even rate a second thought? Yet your love has no limits. Your compassion embraces each and every one. Your mercy remains. Why would we despair when you would hold us so close, so beloved? Teach us then to trust you with our lives and our loves. To trust you even when feelings of faith are weak or situations are hard. Teach us then to love as you love, to love even when compassion asks us to go the more difficult road than simple pity. Teach us also to see the world of hope you hold before us, for you are a God of hope for all that you have created. Gracious God, we pray for all those who are in crisis this day. We thank you for generous hearts and compassionate ones who reach out in times of trouble. We pray for your church, Universal, that the love of Christ would be felt as a healing presence, that hearts and minds would be open to love and not exclude, 
to be open to the beauty and joy that a life trusting in your love can hold for this world. And we pray all of this with the confidence of children of, of Christ, who asked us to pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we have stopped but deliver us from evil. That is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Great God of heaven, my victory won, may I reach heaven's joy so bright and so. New Testament lesson this morning is a reading from Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I want to add my welcome to you on this special day. I hope you've had a chance, if you are our guest this morning, to learn about the church, to meet some of the members of the uh, congregation, and to make new friends. And I hope that you've had an opportunity to share some food as well as the fellowship this morning. Again, we, uh, we welcome you. We make our way, continue to make our way through the Bible and come to the third of the three great kings of the United Monarchy, and that is King Solomon, the son of David, the one who is known both for wisdom and for wealth, the two uh, things that are synonymous with the name Solomon down through the ages. Today in our text, we have a dream that Solomon had in which God came to him and said, ask and I will give you one thing. Ask and it will be given to you. What is it that you want? When I read this, I think of that game we used to play as children of imagining that we found Aladdin's lamp. Rub the lamp, out comes the genie, and you get three wishes, always three. I remember as a kid playing that with my cousins and uh, with other friends, and we would imagine, what would we do with those three wishes? And we would talk about what we would do if we had three wishes. There was the usual million dollars, a cool car, those kinds of things. And maybe fame, maybe be a movie star or something like that. <clears throat> but somewhere along the line, it occurred to somebody in the group that the smart thing to do would be to ask for more wishes. And so then it was, well, I would ask for a thousand more wishes and someone else would up that to a million more wishes and then a million, million more wishes. And then somebody who had discovered the concept of infinity would always say, I would wish for an infinity number of wishes. And then the game was not fun any longer. We learned, first of all, well, what we didn't know was how scary the concept is, how terrifying the concept of getting anything you want would be. That never occurred to us, how terrifying an infinity number of wishes would be. But what did dawn on us, even though we didn't have the words to express it, was that there was a kind of law of supply and demand at oper operating here about wishes. If you have unlimited numbers of wishes, then the value of wishes drops to near nothing. And it becomes no fun anymore, it's boring. And so we had to step in and regulate the wish business to limit it to three wishes once again. No fair uh, wishing for more than three wishes. And then we would dream about what those would be. And they were almost always selfish wishes. As we grew up, of course, the wishes would change in nature, what we would wish for. There was always the million dollars or the bazillion dollars that we might wish for. There was always the cars or the airplanes, the great houses, the girlfriends that we would wish for. And sometimes if we ran out of things to wish for, we would get noble in our wishes and wish for things like world peace or the end of world hunger. Not very often. Most of the time our wishes were selfish ones, self-centered wishes. My cousin Steve has two daughters. Uh, as you know, Susan and I have three daughters. Steve is outnumbered in his family three to one. I'm outnumbered four to one. And at a family reunion a few years ago, Steve reminded the whole group that he and I used to, well, our, our main wish was that one day we would be surrounded by beautiful women. <laughs> and he said that God in the divine sense of humor had granted our wish, and it's true. Not what we probably had in mind at the time. What would you wish for if you had three wishes? It's a fun thing to think about. But with Solomon, he had one wish. He had one desire 
that he could express. And what would it be? Surprisingly, Solomon chose none of the options that we always talked about. I don't remember one time that wisdom was on my list of three wishes. Not once. I suppose now, however, as I have gotten older, somewhere in the list would probably be wisdom. Maybe. On a good day, I might wish for that. What would you wish for? It was for Solomon, that gift of wisdom. What is the one thing? And Solomon said, Oh Lord, I am like a little child. I don't know how to go out and to come in. In other words, I don't know how to be king. This is at the beginning of his reign as king. I'm just like a little child with this. This is a great people. In the Hebrew it means this is a heavy people. It's a heavy burden that I bear. Oh God, the one thing that I desire is wisdom. Wisdom. A surprising choice, perhaps, until you look through the pages of Scripture and you see that 350 times in the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, wisdom is extolled as the most valuable thing. Far more valuable than silver and gold is wisdom. Far more valuable than the most precious jewels is wisdom. Wisdom. So if we were to follow Solomon's lead here and were to make wisdom our primary pursuit, if we were to make wisdom our one wish, our prayer that God would give us wisdom, what would we be praying for? What would we be desiring? Well, we know what it's not. We know that wisdom is not the same thing as education. A few weeks ago, I had lunch with a friend and he was telling me about his father. His father had a third grade education. And in the course of that conversation, he quoted his father three or four times the wisdom that his father had passed on to him. So we know intuitively, don't we, that wisdom and education are two different things. We know that, that intellect and wisdom are two different things. A few years ago, a high school student in California did something that no one else had ever done. She made a perfect 800 on both parts of the SAT, and she also made a perfect score uh, on the entrance exam to uh, the University of California. No student had ever done all three of those things before. Perfect scores on the SAT, perfect score on the admissions exam. Her fellow students called her Wonder Woman, and a reporter asked her the question, what is the meaning of life? And she said, I have no idea. We know that wisdom and intellect are not the same thing. So what is wisdom? I want to go with the dictionary definition this morning and think about that together. What is wisdom? The dictionary says that wisdom is the ability to discern what is true, right, or lasting. And then it gives another definition, insight. The ability to discern what is true, right, or lasting, and insight. That's wisdom. Let's think about those because they are very much in sync with what scripture and tradition has taught us about wisdom, the role of it in our lives. The first is that it's the ability to discern what is true and how important that is when there are all kinds of messages around us telling us who we are, who God is, if God exists, they would question these messages. Um, the nature of reality, the nature of what is good about life. Some of those messages are true and some of those messages are just false. Wisdom is the ability to discern what is true and how important that ability is. When we think about how we discern what is true, as Christians, we come, first of all, to the place of understanding Jesus and Jesus' teachings. Jesus lives out what is true. Jesus teaches 
what is true. In fact, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the way and I am the truth and I am life. Jesus is the measuring stick for what is true. And so when we begin to try to sort through all those messages that we receive, it is Jesus that helps us hear clearly the truth in all the noise. And sometimes the message is, don't get mad, get even. Is that true? What would Jesus say about that? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Do unto others before they do unto you, we might say. We hear that sometimes. What is true? Do unto others, Jesus said, as you would have others do unto you. What is true? Wisdom is the ability to discern that. Wisdom is the ability to discern what is right, to discern the difference between right and wrong, a difficult task sometimes. It's one thing to have knowledge. It's another to discern what is right, what is good. Omar Bradley, way back in 1948, in one of his speeches, said that the world possesses great brilliance but lacks wisdom. We have, he said, great brilliance, but a lack of wisdom. And he said, we have great power, but a lack of conscience. And then he said, the world has nuclear giants, but ethical infants. The general was right. There is a difference between having brilliance, intellect, and discerning what is right and what is wrong. It's true in our own lives as well. What is right? In this situation, what is the right decision? I might be very bright, very intelligent, but still I am faced with the dilemma what is the right thing to do here? What is right? Wisdom is the ability to discern that. Wisdom is the ability to discern what is lasting. That is, what is most important, what really matters. Jesus taught us that what we can see and what we can touch, the things in life, don't last. Moth, moths eat them, the rust uh, eats them away. The thieves break in and steal them, Jesus said. That's the nature of things. So what is it that lasts? It's people. It's relationships. It's the good that we do. That's what lasts. That's what's important. And wisdom is the ability to discern what is lasting, what is junk, and what is treasure. And sometimes it's not obvious to us. There's an old parable about someone who breaks into a store uh, display window late at night and doesn't steal anything, but switches all the price tags on the merchandise in the store window. Some people come by the next day and they see the price tags on these items. Some of the items are not worth very much. Some of them are very valuable, but all the price tags have been switched. And because the tags have been switched, it's impossible to tell. What's the real diamond bracelet? What's the one that's fake? What's, what's the real gold? And what's the one that's gold plated? What's the real solid wood furniture? And what is particle board with a thin veneer? The price tags have all been switched and the values are all mixed up. Wisdom is being able to discern that in life. It is a parable for our lives, isn't it? What is valuable? Sometimes the price tags that society places on things are all scrambled like that store window. What's really valuable? What really matters? Wisdom is the ability to discern that. The dictionary also says wisdom is insight. I, I can see that as insight that Reinhold Niebuhr talked about in his serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I 
cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Wisdom is being able to discern the difference between what we cannot change and what we can change. And then once we have discerned that, to have the serenity to accept what cannot be changed and the courage to change the things that can. How important that is. Wisdom is that ability to discern what cannot and what can be changed. For example, wisdom would clearly show us that the past cannot be changed. And yet, how often do we dwell there? Do we want to go back there and, and change? If we had one wish, what would it be? Well, I wish I could go back and change that one thing. But the past is in the past, and we cannot, cannot change it. We cannot change other people. When a couple comes in for premarital counseling, if it becomes clear that one of them has a problem with the other, and the plan is once they're married, they're going to fix it, that's a red flag. You cannot change another person. Wisdom teaches us that. Wisdom is also the ability, however, to discern what we can change. And sometimes we're mixed up about that as well. We can't change the past, but we can change the present. We can change some important things about the present, and therefore we can change some important things about the future. Yet how often do we believe that because of our background or because of others in our lives or because of fate or whatever, that we're just stuck, that we can do nothing about our present and our future is set. Wisdom teaches us that is not true. We can't change other people, but we can change ourselves. In fact, the only person I can change is me. And wisdom teaches that I can change some important things about me. It is the ability to discern what cannot and can be changed by me, by you. That's wisdom. What is the source of wisdom? The source of wisdom is God. In all those places in Scripture, all those 350 places, it becomes clear that God is the source of all wisdom. And in fact, Paul would say that Christ is the wisdom of God. When I was a teenager, I read the book um, about, that, that asked the question, uh, what would Jesus do? It's the book In His Steps by Charles Sheldon, written 110 years ago. And yet that book had a big impact on my life because it taught me an important principle. And it's had a big impact on the lives of millions of people. And the principle is to ask the question, what would Jesus do? We're to be followers of Jesus. What would Jesus do? What wisdom, Jesus who is the wisdom of God, what would Jesus do in this situation or that situation? What truth does Jesus show? What insight does Jesus give? That's wisdom. And it's my prayer for you and for me that God would grant us just that. That the prayer of Solomon would be our daily prayer. God grant me wisdom that I might discern what is true and what is right what is lasting. Amen.
make us wise enough, gracious God, to be generous toward you and your church and your mission. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn is number 438. We will sing stanzas one and three. And as we sing them, we invite to the chancel you who would join our church today. Susan Geisler, who comes to us from the United Church of Christ in Byron, Illinois. Susan, I want you to know and everyone else to know that after the service, there will be a tour of our facilities. Nearly every week, someone wants to see uh, and learn more about our facilities. And today, we will meet over by the piano, and you will have a chance to know more about our facilities. We're delighted to have you come, Tim. Susan, as you become a part of this community of faith, I ask you, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? I do. And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? I do. Welcome to you. you. So glad to have you. I'm going to ask Susan to stay down front and give you a chance to come by and give her a warm First Church welcome following the close of the service. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.